every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. Good morning. Welcome to Oakwood Community Church. Go ahead and have a seat if you would. I was making sure I had my mic turned on. I was getting all tangled up in my cables there. So we are glad you're here. It is nice that summer is upon us, uh, and it is uh, warm and sunny. A lot of people have been enjoying some outside. I know we have some people traveling this week. That includes Pastor Don. Uh, If you're paying attention to the noisy, windy, Harley uh, noisy uh, video that he did this week, he was letting us know he was heading out of town on vacation. So he'll be gone. He'll be back next week uh, preaching. And Pastor Ben and Kylie are still enjoying their honeymoon, uh, so we've been leaving them alone and uh, hope to see them in some time in the middle of next week. So uh, if you're traveling all this summer, I hope you guys have some great time to get away and enjoy some time as family or with friends as well. But we're glad you're here this morning uh, at Oakwood Community Church to worship with us. We will be wrapping up the sign series, uh, and then next week, PD will be starting a special series that he'll be doing for six or seven weeks this summer. So make sure you're here for the kickoff of that. Uh, If you're a guest with us, we'd love to just connect with you and say thanks for coming to worship with us. Uh, We have a little gift uh, for guests that come. If uh, if you'd like that, uh, we'd love to connect with you. Stop by the cafe counter afterwards, and they should have gotten a bulletin or a program when you came in. There's a little connection card there. You can fill that out, uh, put as much information as you're comfortable with. Uh, If there's information you'd like from us, uh, there's ways you can check off on there or prayer requests you can put on that. Uh, We'll pray as a staff when we meet together this week. Uh, We'll follow up with you, get you information you need. But we'd love to just spend a little time talking with you too, so stop by the cafe. Uh, we'll get you that gift and see what we can do to encourage you. Uh, today, uh, I've got a couple of things I'm going to give you updates for right before the message, but I'm just going to pray right now. Uh, let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord uh, and get into his word together today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for your great love for us. We thank you for uh, what we've been learning about Jesus and his power over all things as we go through uh, your word and look at his miracles and the signs that he does. And as we uh, come before you today, I just pray it helps to slow down and quiet our hearts uh, to see your glory and your goodness uh, as we worship you and to be prepared uh, for what you'd have for us as we get into your word together today. We just thank you for the church family, the opportunity to get together today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to take a moment and introduce our vocalists on our worship team this morning. To my right is Kaylee Rogers. Kaylee is one of my students at Oxford High School, and she's on loan to us from First Baptist Church of Lake Orion, where she regularly attends. And I can just tell you that uh, Kaylee loves the Lord and truly wants to live for Him. So it's just a joy to be singing with, is my mic cutting in and out? Nope? Okay. It's just a joy to have you on the worship team and to be uh, singing with you this morning. And then we have our very own Clara Steck, who is with us. Clara is training to be regularly on our worship team. We'll see her again next month, and and I just appreciate, Clara, you singing with us this morning and working your way onto our worship team. That's great. I do want to take a moment and also recognize, if you don't mind, uh, how many of you have been going to Oakwood for less than two years? Uh, You've been attending Oakwood for less than two years. Uh, let me just roll that number to five. Five years or less. How many have been coming five years or less? That's, That's many of us. That includes me and my family. So I don't know if you know this, but our drummer is Colton Rodella. We have a couple drummers, but Colton is in the cage this morning. Thank you for recognizing him. I just want to mention that I visited Oakwood many years ago. We were just looking at different churches and stuff, and I remember hearing this incredible drummer. You know, I'm a music person, and so I'm like, wow, this drummer's really good. And the cage used to be down here. How many were at Oakwood 10, 11 years ago? 10, 11 years ago. And uh, when the message started, uh, out from the drum cage comes this little young boy. And it was Colton. He started playing here at Oakwood when he was 10 years old. Uh, So he's been playing. uh, He tells me he's 21 now. So he's been playing over a decade here, but started when he was 10 years old. That's faithful ministry right there. And Colton... 
I just love working with you. Colton has a way of reading my mind where I want to go in the music and stuff, and I don't always explain to him what's going on, and he just, he goes there. So it's really great working with you. Thank you, Colton, for your faithfulness in this ministry. Um, yeah, I think that's great. This morning, we want to set our, our thoughts, our hearts on the Lord. Check, check. Testing. Having said that, having check, said that, have you ever MCC? sat in a worship service and your mind hasn't been there. You're just checked out, mentally numb. Has that ever happened for you? Check, check. Maybe emotionally disconnected as well. Testing, one, two, three. Uh, the songs, the prayers, the sermon just kind of passing over you as you just count down the minutes till you leave. This has happened for me. I don't know about for you. But I think it, it can be something that as Christians we can go through uh, periodically this time where God isn't at the place in our life where he should be. And so we come to church and it's not the same experience. Do you know what I'm talking about? And maybe you haven't experienced that, but I think a lot of us have. And, and I've been at those times where, where God just hasn't been in the rightful place in my life, and perhaps it's because of just laziness. You know, we get lazy. We lose that discipline of just focusing our minds on the Lord. Maybe there's an unconfessed sin, and so then we come to church, and there's a disconnect there because we don't really want to listen because we'd be convicted, and uh, we'd have to let go of that thing we've been holding on to that separates us from fellowship with God. Or maybe there's just all this stuff going on in our life, these struggles, these trials, and it's just clouding our mind, and, and we're, setting, we're using that as an excuse to set God aside rather than using that time to cling to Him as, as our help. Let's commit this morning to set aside the stuff of this life to... Give undivided focus on God, to clear our minds and enter into a time where we listen to God and we recognize how great He is and all that He has done for us. Our first song talks about the greatness of Jesus Christ our Lord. As we sing this song, consider all that He has done for you. He paid a great cost to satisfy our debt by dying on a cross for our sins. He certainly deserves our attention. Let's stand together and give praise to our Lord as we sing. From heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. You never know the sacrifice you made. For all our sin and all our shame, you took the nails and took our place. No one else could do what you have done. One name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all. From the grave where death would die, you rose again. And brought us life You're reigning now The Savior of the world You're reigning now The Savior of the world One name is higher One name is strong Jesus Messiah, to you alone, a praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. We sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever, and lift your name, we lift your name. We sing your praise, we sing your praise, we sing your praise forever, and lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all, one name is higher, one name is 
song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Will you pray with me? God, as your children, we want to live for you. We have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and through faith in him, we are made new. Lord, I pray that the people at Oakwood, all of us, would be filled with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we will walk in a manner worthy of you and your gospel, pleasing you in every way. God, strengthen us with all power according to your glorious might. Lord, we love you and we want to live for you. And Lord, as we take up our offering, please use it to further the gospel here in our area and, and abroad through our missionaries. God, we give our lives and this gift to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus. 
Would you agree there's many things as Christians we can be thankful to God for, just so many things. And I hope first and foremost we never lose our gratitude for what he has done for us and making a way for us to be right with God by settling our sin debt, by taking to the cross, shedding his blood, dying, being buried, and then rising again. We do serve a resurrected king, don't we? Let's stand together as we continue to praise and worship our resurrected king. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. the king destiny feeding hallelujah he's alive hallelujah he's alive there's a reason why our hearts can be courageous there's a reason why the dead are made alive there's a reason why we share his resurrection. Jesus is alive. Oh, he's alive. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. Sting. The world could not ignore it when all the saints are roaring. Hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The grave could not ignore it. All of heaven's roaring. Hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The world could not ignore it. All the saints are roaring. Hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. Destiny. Hallelujah, he's alive. Hallelujah, he's alive. 
forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be you, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Thank you, worship team. Go ahead and have a seat. I appreciate Christopher, Colton, Kaylee, and Clara today. The, the <laughs> I don't know if they're all C's. There may be a K there for Kaylee. But uh, just in case you guys didn't know, Clara is actually my daughter. Uh, so I've been able to sing with her before. But she, uh, uh, just an opportunity for me to brag on her a little bit. Uh, she's not about doing that. But um, she's a good singer. And as we think about our worship people, we want people, they can sing decently well. But our biggest concern is that people have a heart for the Lord and that they don't want to bring the glory on themselves. They want to give the glory to God. And I'm just proud of her because I know she's spending time in God's Word. She loves Him. She loves to sing. And she's using her gifts uh, because of her heart for Him and desire to lift Him up. If you've got that heart, uh, a little bit of gifts to uh, you know, talk to us. There's opportunities to serve uh, and get involved with things like worship or plenty of other things behind the scenes. I need some people for technology too. Maybe you don't like to sing, but you want to put the words up on the screen for other people to sing. If you've got a heart for God uh, and a heart to serve, uh, we got ways that you can do that here at Oakwood, and we'd love to help you get involved there. Uh, before we jump into uh, the message uh, this morning, I wanted to just highlight a couple of things. Uh, we're coming to the end of June, which is kind of the end of our fiscal and leadership year as well. So I want to take a moment for those that are here uh, and just honor uh, the elders, deacons, treasurer uh, that have been serving and are going to be stepping down and taking a break from that role, uh, as well as those that are starting at, at this point. So if you're here this morning uh, and have been one of those people singing, when I call your name, if you've been serving, uh, go ahead and stand for me and stay standing until everyone's uh, done. Our elder that's going to be going off is Bruce Knopf, uh, and he's here. If you'd stand up for us. We have four deacons uh, that have been serving faithfully that are going to be stepping down at this point. Marty McDaniel, uh, Dan Koskinen, Matt Young, 
and Tim Dangle, I believe. I should have a few of those around, but some of them might be wandering around doing other things. Uh, and then Brenda Hunter has also served faithfully as our treasurer for a number of years uh, and is stepping away from that role too. So let's give them a hand of uh, applause, just appreciating their time and their service and their leadership. I uh, definitely appreciate that. And then we have others that are stepping in uh, to, to take their place and to move things forward as well. We definitely appreciate them. So uh, with the elders, we've got Bruce Paris. Uh, he's back there waving his hand on one of the video cameras this morning. Uh, and Jim Bongiorno as well. Uh, you can go stand up if you would as well. And then uh, we got Deacons Joe Penzine. Not sure if Joe's here. Jim Spezia, Jason Hall, and Brian Mikesell. So we've got a bunch of J's and B's coming on here as well. And then uh, last but not least, Beth Phillips is coming on to serve uh, as uh, treasurer again right now. And that, again, just a reminder, that's a tr uh, temporary role. Uh, Brenda had to step down, and Beth has served in that role before, and she's stepping up uh, to do that. And she's a servant and willing to do that for a while. But we are looking for someone uh, with financial gifts, fiscal gifts, that would be willing to maybe serve in that role and help us move forward. So if, if that's you and we're not aware of that, you've got some talents, uh, talk to us, and we can tell you more about what that role is about. But we appreciate uh, not only our leaders, but everyone who's serving, and there are opportunities. We all have gifts. We all have abilities. And as the body of Christ, we've all got to use them for God's glory and to build each other up and encourage the body of Christ and to reach out in our community. And that's what all that's about. So just wanted to take a moment uh, and do that. And I also wanted to remind you guys, uh, PD mentioned it last week. Uh, it was in the video. There's information out on the counter, but we want to make sure people don't miss out. We have a special business meeting coming up in two weeks. Uh, it's going to be on July 14th. We're going to do it before the service again, 9.30 a.m. Uh, and it's for a specific purpose. We had our annual meeting uh, for the approval of the budget, uh, for officers, those types of things. This one is specifically a proposal to purchase the land out in front of the church. Uh, there's a couple acres that are going up for sale uh, out in front of the church. Uh, there's a sheet out in the lobby that's got the basics on there, the, the what, the why, and the how, just the basics. But we want you to come uh, to that meeting on the 14th where the church has the opportunity because we're uh, looking at purchasing some other property. The church needs to be involved in that decision. Uh, so we want people here for that. Uh, if you have questions, uh, some of the elders will be available in the conference room after the service today as well as next week. And we encourage you to come uh, talk to us if you want more information about that. Uh, if you're concerned about it or if you have questions about it, come talk to us over the next couple of weeks before that meeting. Uh, we want that meeting time to be a simple time, but we also want to hear from you. And if you have concerns, we want to be able to address those uh, all together as well. So those are just some uh, business things I wanted to make sure people were aware of. And then uh, we're going to get into uh, our message this morning. So we are wrapping up the signs series, uh, which is all about the miracles of Jesus. And uh, PD joked a couple weeks ago, I think he, uh, last week he had the pigs flying up here because uh, of the demon possessed man. The pigs, uh, the, the demons went into the pigs and drowned all the pigs. Uh, and the week before that, he had someone dropping through the ceiling, right? And he joked that today all I had to do was raise somebody from the dead. <laughs> so good luck with that. But as we start talking about what we're going to talk about today, I want us to just focus for a moment on a topic that's a little difficult for us in our world. How many of us like that sound? No. It's eerie, isn't it? That's the last thing we want to hear. And I know for some of you, you guys may have people in your own family that have just gone through that or in the midst of, of concern that that's coming, and I don't want to make light of that. The reality is death is something uh, that is hard. And the idea of something like that, a heartbeat stopping, reminds us of, of a fear of death and the perspective that we have of death as humans. And that basic pr perspective is this. Death is painful. Death is inevitable. And death is final. It's painful. It's inevitable. It's final. We're broken people. Because of the, the curse and the fall, we know that physical death is coming. And once that happens, 
that's the end. And we want to avoid that at all costs. The best we can do in our own human efforts is to delay death. The best that we can do in our own human efforts is to delay death, to try to keep that heartbeat going a little bit longer. And none of us really want to go there. Now we get into all the theological stuff and we're going to talk about some of that as we get into today. Obviously, if we know Jesus, there's hope and we're going there as we get into the passage today. But that's not a fun subject. It's not one we want to talk about and it's not an easy thing to experience. If you have a loved one that has died or you've gone through that process or, or it's, you know, they're on their deathbed, that's painful. It's heart-wrenching. It's hard and it's the last thing that we want to be dealing with in our life. As we get into this topic today, we're going to look at the power of Jesus as we think about his miracles and what it reveals about who he is and what that means for us. I want to start today telling a story uh, in my own experience and some of the heartache that we've gone through. It's a story I've only told a handful of people close to me. I've never shared it publicly, and I'll do my best to get through it. Uh, We have, for those of you that know uh, me, my wife Carrie uh, over here, uh, we have four kids. Uh, We've been blessed with three through uh, natural birth, and then we've been blessed by another uh, addition to our family uh, beyond that. Our niece is a part of our family as well, and there's four of us. We've got four teenagers, so definitely keep praying for us. I appreciate that greatly. Um, We uh, have four kids, uh, but our first pregnancy ended uh, with a lot of heartache and heartbreak uh, with a miscarriage. Uh, We had just gone to Hawaii and celebrated uh, graduating from Bible college uh, together and came back and found out the news that the baby that we had been waiting for and expecting and trying for for a while uh, had stopped developing and had died, and we lost that. And that was a heart-wrenching time, and I know many of you uh, have experienced miscarriage and that, that death and the hurt, the hurt and the pain that comes uh, with that. And uh, we, we grieve with you. I know that's difficult. Uh, thankfully, God does bring healing and he does bring hope. But when you lose a child, no matter what and when, it's a difficult situation. Uh, so thankfully, we were able to go on and uh, actually conceive pretty quickly. And Sam uh, was born f- uh, fairly quickly after that misconception. Uh, it didn't take away the pain and the hurt, but it certainly uh, helped us move forward. Uh, just with the joy, the blessings that God was giving us. And then Clara was born uh, uh, not quite two years later. So at the, the point of the story that I'm telling you today, we had two kids. Uh, we'd already been born. We miscarried our first. And so we were pregnant again. Uh, Carrie had always said she wanted to have all her kids before she was 30, but we waited five years or so to, to start having kids as we got married. And so we were kind of pumping them out pretty quick there <laughs> towards the end of our 30s, trying to meet that self-imposed deadline. Um, so we have two, two young kids. Uh, we're pregnant again. Uh, we're about 11 or 12 weeks along. And Carrie starts experiencing a lot of pain and cramping and bleeding. Um, and we've been through it before. And we knew um, what was probably happening. And so you know, we got to the doctor and we got in with an ultrasound tech. And uh, we, we sat there and we'd been through quite a few ultrasounds at this point. Uh, so we kind of knew we were obviously pros at reading them, but you know the basics, you know when there's a heartbeat, you know when there's a good things, you know when there's signs of trouble. Uh, The first thing we saw when the ultrasound tech uh, came up and and brought up the image uh, was there was actually two embryonic sacs uh, in there. And one of them was pretty much flattened out like a pancake. Uh, The fetus wasn't developing. And pretty much early on, within the first couple minutes, the the techs, you know, they're not supposed to say anything, but this one was pretty chatty at the beginning of our our meeting that day. Uh, She said, it looks like you're miscarrying twins. And... uh, so, I mean, at that point, tears start rolling. Uh, we'd been through it before. It's the last thing I want. Here I am as a father experiencing that grief and that loss again myself. And on top of that, I'm, I'm seeing my wife and the pain that I know that that's causing her going through that. Oh, it was heart-wrenching. And so I mean, literally she's going on for minutes, you know, looking around, doing stuff. And she says, you know, I'm going to take some measurements, try to find out how old uh, the babies were, uh, those types of things. And, and it's going on, and I can see the terror and the heartbreak on my wife's face. And she's looking at me, and, and I'm looking at her. And, 
It was just this eerie silence. Minutes had gone by, and we're watching it, seeing nothing. No flicker, no movement. And all I could do was pray. All I could do was pray. I felt so hopeless, so powerless, and I was. Because I had no power in that moment. I was helpless. I could try to comfort my wife, but good luck with that. When, when your wife's losing a child. All I could do was pray. And I cried out in my despair. And I said, Lord, you know the pain that we've gone through, and I know how hard this is going to be for us to go through this again. The one baby wasn't there, but I cried out in faith, and I said, Lord, I can't do anything about this, but you can. You can make that heart start beating. And it it sounded like pleading. I was probably doing some bargaining in my head. We've all been in those situations, right, where you're, you're trying to bargain with God, and, and I don't remember everything about what was said and how it was done. But I remember what happened next. All of a sudden, minutes had been going by. All of a sudden, beep, 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 beep. there was a heartbeat. Carrie and I just looked at each other in, in disbelief. She knew what I had prayed. We were still in the midst of just crying. Heartache, heartbreak. The tech, who had been pretty chatty and bubbly up until uh, that point, she was speechless. She couldn't explain it. And Carrie and I know what happened. It had nothing to do with me. Powerless had everything to do with God. And I don't know why he chose to do what he did in that moment. And I have no problem. I have no doubts. I know other people, even though they shared it, well, you know, they just missed the heartbeat. That's, and that's fine. That can be your perspective. That, that's fine. But we know how long it was. We know what we saw. We know what we prayed. We know what God did. And we know our God is the God of miracles and that we're powerless. But he is ultimately powerful. We're afraid of death. We don't want to experience death. Uh, it's one of those things we want to avoid. Here's a picture of Bree at 19 months, about five or six weeks later. So we lost the twin, but her heart started beating. And we had to go through a bunch more ultrasounds. There were other complications and challenges, uh, but God brought her into this world in a miraculous way. Uh, and, and all of our kids are blessings to us. Um, but we believe wholeheartedly that there was a physical miracle that took place uh, with Bree. And I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that to, to bring any glory to myself. As we get into this passage today, we're going to see very clearly there's nothing we can do but our Father and our Lord have power over death. And that's the big idea today. Death is not a final deadline for Jesus Death is not a final deadline for Jesus. It's the end in our minds, and we want to avoid it at all costs, but it's not a final deadline. There's hope. He has power even over death. And if that's true, that should change our lives and our perspective about all things. Let's pray, and then we'll get into John 11. I encourage you to turn there. We're going to be walking through this passage together in, in little chunks. Uh, There's quite a few verses today, but we'll, we'll kind of weave through that together. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the way that you revealed yourself to us uh, in truth, uh, through scriptures, through other people, through the testimony of others, uh, through personally the way that you've worked in our lives and your love and your forgiveness and your grace and your power. And we just want to come before you with open hearts today to hear what you would have to hear, to see you as you are, and that you would encourage us, strengthen our faith, and give us the courage to live boldly for you in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn, if you would, to John 11. Um, we're going to kind of go through this passage in, in a handful of different chunks and just kind of look at it uh, bit by bit. 
So last time I preached was a few months ago, and uh, we were actually kind of getting ready to introduce the sign series then, and I actually preached kind of John eleven forty five into chapter 12, and so now here I am coming back. The next time I'm preaching, I'm preaching John 11, 1 through 44 uh, up to that, and uh, we talked told you at that time as we got into the science series that uh, what I'm preaching today is kind of the final uh, visible miracle of Jesus before his own resurrection, uh, the resurrection of Lazarus, and that's what we're going to get into. But as we get into this, when we go through difficult and dark times uh, in our own sinful, fallen human nature, uh, we're going to see this with some of the people and the characters in this story, but one of the things we find out is our deficiencies are exposed during difficulties. Our deficiencies in our faith, in our thinking, and in the ways that we're living, all those types of things are often exposed uh, during difficult times. And we're going to see that a little bit as we go uh, through that. If you're following along in your notes, you can fill those in. If you'd like to do that, feel free. Uh, But we're going to jump in uh, to John chapter 11, the first four verses, uh, and just look at the, the first scene here, the reality of the difficulty that's happening here. Lazarus is on his deathbed. So uh, chapter 11, the first four verses. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom uh, you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So here we are, uh, the first four verses just setting the scene. The reality is Jesus had a special relationship uh, with this family in Bethany, Mary, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And we didn't know up until this point that they were all uh, connected, but John makes it very clear for us here. Uh, They're brothers and sisters. Uh, Jesus loved him dearly. There was a special bond and relationship there. And so here we are, uh, just as much as we hate death and we hate uh, sickness and the reality of, of that happening, Jesus hears of a good friend Uh, that's pretty much on his deathbed. It's an urgent situation. They're sending to him uh, at least a day, maybe two days journey away uh, to like, he's he's dying, we need some help here. Come help us out. It was a plea for help. It was one of those crying out uh, in their desperation, uh, asking for help. Uh, And so Jesus receives word of that and his reply seems fairly hopeful. I would think to the family, you know, what's he say there in verse four? This illness does not lead to death. Uh, it's for the glory of the God so the Son may be glorified through it. You hear that and you think, oh, great, all right. Something, this is, this is going to go the way we wanted. We asked Jesus for some help. He's going to help us out. Lazarus isn't going to die. I'm sure they were taking some initial consolation uh, from his response. And so uh, all that sounds good uh, in the midst of that. Before we move on to the next uh, verse, I want to just show you a little bit. One of the things that uh, can get a little confusing here is looking at where Jesus is and where they're at. So this, this family's from uh, Bethany, and we'll call it Bethany number one, uh, which is about two miles east of Jerusalem. So you got Jer- uh, Jerusalem here, and this is the Bethany where Mary, Martha, uh, and Lazarus lived, uh, just outside of the city, and Jesus spent some time with them at different points. Uh, it's pretty clear in the Gospels. Uh, but if you look back into the uh, verse, or the chapter right before this, in John chapter 10, uh, Jesus had got, been going through doing other miracles, and the Jews picked up stones to stone him, and it says that basically they fleed the region, uh, and they went to the area where, uh, on the other side of the Jordan, across the Jordan, uh, where John was originally baptizing. You look back at the beginning of John, uh, and I think it's jo- John 1, verse 38, uh, that's also referred to as Bethany in some translations. And so there's another other place, uh, this map was the best one I could find that kind of depicted them, and, and the, the area is questionable, but it's on the other side of the Jordan River here, uh, Bethany beyond the Jordan is what this map labels it as, uh, but it's probably at least 40 kilometers away or so, uh, for sure a day, uh, maybe two days journey away uh, from where uh, Lazarus is at uh, in terms of his house and his, his um setting at that point. So just just helped me as I was studying this passage to understand where Jesus is at in relation to them and uh, that there's actually two potential Bethanies, uh, one, only one's named in this story, uh, but it's important for us to just understand some of those. So that's the reality. Lazarus uh, is, uh, you know, 40 kilometers west on his deathbed. Jesus had fled because he was being threatened. His own life was being threatened, uh, and he's on the other side of the Jordan with his disciples. Mary and Martha send word that he's sick and need help, and uh, Jesus 
receives the word and sounds like he's got a good plan in mind to keep him from dying, right? Well, and then we get to Jesus' uh, overall reaction, the next couple of verses, and ultimately find out that Jesus delays, and that's kind of weird for us to consider. Let's look at verses five and six. So he said this, this illness does not lead to death, but then verse five, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister uh, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he ran as quickly as he could to Bethany to save him. Wait a second. You guys, anybody reading along with me? Isn't that what your version says? You guys aren't reading. Some of you are. So when he heard, so Jesus loved him, right? So he loves him. He hears that he's sick. He's telling him it's not going to lead to death. What's our expectation that he's going to do? He's going to take a beeline to it, or he's going to like snap his fingers, you know, and say, he's good. Forget about it. You know, no problem, right? But no, it says, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. What? Come on, Jesus, really? One of your best friends is sick. You love the guy, and you're staying there two more days once you find out he's on his deathbed? That doesn't add up, right, in our mind. That doesn't make sense. That's not the reaction and the response that we're expecting uh, from Jesus who loves this guy. Uh, but that's what he does. And so he delays two days, and, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why? Uh, we're going to see the statements a little bit later. We'll kind of reflect back on the statements that Jesus makes uh, in the midst of this, and, and we'll see it as we kind of walk through it a little bit. But Jesus has a purpose in mind. He loves them, but that doesn't mean that he's going to keep them from experiencing all the pain and the hardship of life, right? He's got a bigger plan and a bigger purpose in mind that we'll see unfold uh, throughout this. So in his love, he's delaying for a reason, and we'll get there. All right, so now we see some of the other characters kind of enter the story. Uh, next, we're going to see the disciples and their doubt in the next uh, 10 verses or so here. So picking up in verse 7. Uh, so he said, then after he said this, uh, after this he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going to go there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, then he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that me, we may die with him. Not a very hopeful response there <laughs> from, from Thomas, right? So here we are, the disciples. So Jesus delays. And now he's saying we're gonna go back to Judea. And he had just fled there because the Jews would picked up stones to kill him. Uh, he'd been revealing his identity and he'd been threatening them. If you look back at that message I did a few, week, a few months ago called The Rejected King, and it was that whole idea uh, of the tension that was building between Jesus as he revealed himself as the Son of God and the Jewish leaders who he was essentially threatening. Their identity and their purpose and their position uh, and, and that, that tension was rising. And this situation they're in today, as you're gonna see at the end, becomes uh, the final straw for them. But that tension is there. They had just been threatening to kill his life and they had fled and I'm sure the disciples were very glad for that. And now Jesus is saying, we're gonna go back. And they're like, no, that doesn't make sense. Does not compute. Let's think of another plan, Jesus. Oh, he's, he's just sleeping. He's fine. He's gonna recover. He'll be okay. And then even when Jesus insists, Thomas's response is, all right, we'll go and die with you. Right? There's, there's not a lot of hope. There's not a lot of faith that Jesus is in charge of the situation and he's got things under control. In the midst of that, uh, Jesus makes that statement about there not being 12 hours in the day uh, and walking in the day versus the night. And uh, I think that, that really comes down to, we're not going to get into that, it's not the crucial part of the story, uh, but if I had to, to summarize it or find a comparison, it's kind of like when Jesus says at other times, you know, if anyone wants to save his life, uh, he'll lose it. But if everyone loses his life for my sake, he will find it. And that idea that we need to obey what God has for us. God's plan, his purpose, we need to pursue that at all costs. If we're just seeking to protect our own skin, 
you know, we're going to walk in the darkness and we're not going to walk in the light and obedience and fellowship with God. Uh, that's going to be living in fear, not living in faith. Uh, and that's not what Jesus has for us as his followers. Uh, and so we see uh, very clearly the disciples are doubting. They don't like the plan. They think this means sure death for them uh, as they head back uh, to, to Judea. But they go resigned. You know, Thomas, he's a doubter. We've known that. We've looked at some of the other stuff. At least he's willing to go and say, all right, I'll die with you, Jesus, if that's what I got to do. So that's a good thing, I guess, uh, in the midst of that. But we see the disciples. We see their doubt. Uh, And next, we're going to look at the sisters and their response, and we see discouragement from them. So pick it up in 17. I got a couple of longer sections here uh, to walk through. And it says, now, when Jesus came, so he arrives at Bethany, uh, it says, Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Pause right there. So how has he been in the tomb for four days? You do the math, and, and it's, you, you, we don't know exactly the, the timeline, but there's some different conceivable ways that that could be happened. Like I said, the place where he was at was at very least a day's journey away. Maybe two days journey, uh, depending on exactly where they were at. And so uh, the, the messengers come, they tell them, Jesus said, ah, this illness doesn't lead to death. But at some point, Jesus knows he's, di- he's died. Um, and he stayed there a couple more days. Uh, so if he died, and then they stayed there a couple more days, and then they took another day or two journey, it's very easy to get to four uh, days in terms of why it had been that long uh, when Jesus got there. So we don't know the exact timeline, but it's very feasible. Uh, four days is not uh, hard to come by as you look at the, the, the details of the text and how far away they were. So yeah, the couple days they stay in there and the journey time and we get there pretty easy. So Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Going on, when she, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That sounds familiar. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And so that's a longer section, but we see the, the response of the sisters and the, the Jews who were kind of surrounding them as was part of their custom and grieving with those who were in loss and uh, bereavement. And so three times, basically the same thing said by three different people or groups, right? Lord, if you had have just been here, you could have kept Lazarus from dying. And you can do the little compare and contrast with Mary and Martha. Both of them are obviously hurting, grieving, as they should be. Death is painful. For the survivors, that's painful. It it brings grief. That's normal. That's natural. They are feeling disillusioned, discouraged, hurt. And and so you see that, you know, we see the difference. And you could make it, you know, start making some comparisons. You look at the other scenario of Mary and Martha. We're not looking back at that. But Mary was the one sitting at Jesus' feet. Martha was the busy busy body going around. So in this situation, you know, she hears that Jesus is on his way. Martha runs out the door to go meet him, right? And where's Mary at? 
she's still sitting down in the house, you know, and, you know, that's not a a key part of it. That might just be part of their personality, who knows. Uh, But we do see a little bit of a more uh, more important comparison in the contrast and how they respond. They both say the same thing initially. Lord, if you would have been here, you could have kept my my brother from dying. That's the almost word for word, the exact same response both of them had. Martha had another statement on the other side of hers. Do you remember what it was? Even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And then Jesus replies, Lazarus will rise again. And then she shows she's a good theologian. I know he's going to rise again in the, in the last days, right? And, and then Jesus points her, resurrection isn't just an event. It's a person. The resurrection is not just an event that's coming in the end. It's a person. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet will he live. It's not just about the last day. So Martha's pretty smart. She's got some good things. She's got some good thinking. It's normal for her to be discouraged and be hurting and grieving, but she's still got some hope mixed in there. But she still doesn't fully get who Jesus is or what's going on in the midst of it. Mary is even more probably discouraged, despairing. We don't see hints of hope in there. Uh, She stays in the house until she's called basically to come and meet with Jesus and then she gets there and you can just feel her despair and her heartbrokenness. Lord, if you'd just been here, you could have kept my my brother from dying. And you do see Jesus' compassion, his love in the midst of his response. That, That Bible verse everybody loves to memorize because it's only two verses, right? Jesus wept. He's a compassionate caring. He loved this family deeply. It's a poignant uh, moment for us to be able to get in the midst of Jesus with this family that he's close to and see how he interacts with them uh, in the midst of this situation. As he's, he's caring for them, but trying to point them to something bigger, to himself ultimately. So the sisters are discouraged. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about Jesus' response in terms of where it says he was moved deeply here in just a moment. Uh, but the, la- the next couple verses, just verses 37 and 38, 38, I think it points to the reality of everyone's denseness. I had to go with D words, you know, and, and, and Phoebe's a good influence there. It points to everyone's denseness. So let's look at verses 37 and 38 real quick, uh, and then we will uh, make a few other comments. Uh, so some of them, again, the Jews that were there said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone lay against it. So the the reality is everybody in the story is a little bit dense. The disciples are dense. They're not getting it all, right? The the sisters aren't quite getting it. Martha's got a little bit more of a clue than Mary does. Um, And then the Jews are saying that, but Jesus heard the same statement three times, and I think he's getting a little frustrated. We see that statement that says deeply moved, and, and we just think, oh, this is Jesus and his compassion. He's heartbroken, right? He's hurting along with them. We're supposed to grieve with those who grieve, weep with those who weep, right? That's what Jesus is doing, and there is some of that going on. And it says that great, Jesus was greatly troubled uh, early on, but two times he uses the same phrase, and it's just not that Jesus was hurting and heartbroken. He was indignant. He was frustrated. He was angry, at the response that he was getting from people. The verse one commentary said it this way, that same word, and it's, let me get it right, embryomai, I kept wanting to say embryomai because I've been thinking about embryonic sacs and the story I told earlier, embryomai is the Greek word. One commentator said it this way, that uh, that word is also used in other literature talking about horses snorting in frustration, you know, that, that kind of, that snort, that snort of indignation or frustration or anger. So, so there's, there's some righteous anger in there in Jesus. When he's being deeply moved, he's, it's not just that he's com- caring and compassionate about the situation going on. That is true, but he's frustrated. Because here these people are saying, well, if you'd have just shown up before he died, you could have done something, right? Well, what, take that logic if he's got the power to save the guy from dying in the first place take that logic one step for, further what else do you think he can do and Jesus is frustrated with the denseness of people he's trying to reveal his power and his glory and his identity to them and they're just slow to get it thank goodness we're not slow to get it right oh uh, wait <laughs> 
the reality is we are. So Jesus is angry, he's frustrated, but he's also hurting uh, because he sees the grief uh, that this death has caused. But he's got a bigger plan in mind. And so we, we've looked at the reality and Jesus' reaction and then kind of the reaction of the different people and some of the struggles and the deficiencies that are being brought up in the midst of this difficult situation facing death. But Jesus had a purpose in mind from the beginning. The reason he let Lazarus die the reason he let it make sure it was four days, four days he was in the grave before he showed up on the scene, we're gonna see here in a little bit. The reason is the resurrection. And not just this event, but to point to himself as the resurrection and the life. Let's read the rest of the story and we'll start driving this home. So uh, verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a sta- stone was laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus delayed for a reason. Four days, the guy stunk. There was no doubt. You could doubt whether or not Bree's heartbeat stopped and God brought it back to life. I don't care. I don't care. You could, you could doubt that. That's fine. I think I know what happened. I was there. I saw it. But you could doubt that. I don't care. Jesus left no shadow of a doubt. Lazarus was dead. He stunk. He was all wrapped up. It was done. As far as people's mind were, it was too late. The deadline had passed. It was finished. It was done. The end was there. Jesus made sure they understood that the big idea that we're looking at death is not a final deadline for Jesus they still didn't get the reality of who he was and the power that he had and in the midst of the resurrection in the midst of all these miracles that we've been looking at of Jesus he continues to reveal his identity and his glory I think we'll have these verses come up on the side screen real quick 11.4 just looking back at them real quickly uh, some of the statements that Jesus said Uh, When Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then 40 through 42 that we just looked at. Then Jesus, there we go. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you uh, that uh, you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus had a plan from the beginning to reveal his glory, to reveal his identity as the Son of God, holding all authority and power over life and death, everything. He could have you know, made, him, made him heal, but he'd done that many, many times, right? And people still weren't getting the reality of who he was and what that meant. So he needed to do something else to reveal his identity and his glory. And then from there, he leaves it uh, to require a response for us. And um, let's look at 11, 14, and 15 real quick, just to, to recap. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let's go to him. So Jesus is warning a response of faith. The key verses I put on this sheet for you today in the notes are verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. At the end, he's asking, do you believe this? He's requiring a response. He's revealing his identity. He's revealing his glory. He's revealing his power over all things. And he's calling for a response. He wants people to know him and to believe him and to trust in him and to follow him. But he leaves that choice up to us. 
Uh, looking back, just recapping the signs of uh, Jesus, we said this back at the beginning of the series, the purpose of the signs is to authenticate the character of Jesus and his relationship with his heavenly Father. All the miracles were done with a purpose, to authenticate who he was. And then there's this pattern that unfolds. He reveals his identity, identity. usually that stirs up some controversy and requires a choice. You can see that pattern all throughout John as you read through it and you see the miracles that Jesus does and the tension that's building with the Jewish leaders in particular and that call to believe in him or the other option is to reject him. And as we go on, if you look at what people do after this, uh, that's what we see happens. Uh, 45, the next few verses says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what he did, believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So here's Jesus proving his power over death. And the irony of it is it sealed his fate, or so the Jews thought. They made the decision from that point forward to put him to death and to kill Lazarus again because they had to shut this up because they were threatened. And we know how the story ends from there. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? Brought him back to life. But he came hopping out of the tomb, you know. His, his, his head was still bandaged up. He couldn't see anything. Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. He's, he's bound up. He can't do anything. He's still in his physical body. Jesus brought him back in a temporal, human, fleshly way. Jesus' resurrection was a spiritual one. Where were the grave clothes when Jesus rose from the dead? They were still sitting in the grave. Lazarus was rose again in a fleshly resurrection, a human resurrection. Jesus rose again in a spiritual resurrection. And that's what he offers us. That's what he offers for us if we would believe in him. But we have a choice. And just like the Jews at that time, many of them believed in him. Others wanted to shut him up because there was a threat to their way of life. And guess what? That's the same choice that we're left with today. God has revealed Jesus is the Son of God. These miracles uh, prove that over and over. He has all authority on heaven and earth. And we're left to choose. If that's true, we believe in it, it changes everything. Let's not be like the Jews who are threatened and like, I want to kind of be in charge of my own life and I don't want my position and my plans and my priorities to get snuffed out here. So I'm going to reject that and shut it out. Those are the choices that we have though. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The best thing that we can do in this physical, li- the physical life is to hope to delay death. But the good news is that Jesus has defeated it for good. Jesus has defeated death. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 real quick. Uh, worship team, you guys come on, go ahead and come up here. and I'm going to ask for a, an audible here, Christopher, if you'd be okay. Can we do um, Praise the King as the closer instead? That would be awesome. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57, it says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we, uh, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality then the saying that is written will come true death has been swallowed in victory O death uh, where is your victory and where O death is your sting The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We can look forward to a day. Revelation 21 tells us that there's a day coming where there is no more death. There's no more mourning. There's no more pain. There's no more tears. That's amazing, and we should be longing for that. The only way it's possible is through Jesus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I've revealed myself to you that you would believe in me and follow me. Start your eternal life now in a relationship with me and enjoy it forever. But if you reject me, you're rejecting the king of everything. And that's going to come with consequences too. As we move towards wrapping it up, just want to encourage you guys uh, to, to think about where you're at in your relationship with Christ. If he has power over life and death, and he has power over all things, and he's the son of God, it should change everything in terms of our priorities and what we're doing in our life. As we go through difficulties in this world, that's part of it. Jesus told us there was going to be troubles. And in the midst of that, we, we see some of our deficiencies, our doubt, our struggles, our discouragement, all those types of things that we've seen in some of the others. That's part of our sinfulness. And in the midst of those things, don't just get disheartened by seeing your own struggles and your own failures. God wants us to grow. Even as we went through this whole situation with his family and with his disciples, that was the point. He wanted their faith to grow, not to stay where it was. They had seen bits of it. They believed bits of it. But he wanted their faith to continue to grow, that they would be willing to understand who he is and follow him no matter what. So as you look through, maybe, this, the, maybe you're facing some dark times or some difficulties or you're struggling with some doubt or some discouragement, don't stay there. Look to Jesus, the author of life, the resurrection in the life. Fix your eyes on him and allow him to continue to grow and change you and, and increase your faith. Ultimately, we just need to realize this, that death isn't the final deadline for Jesus. We have the hope of a new life if we believe in him. And we've been given that great commission, the same mission that he's, he was on this earth to do to help others understand that. He wants us to have an abundant life full of great relationships and, and fruitfulness. But ultimately, we're on mission with him to save others and to help them understand this reality too. If he is the son of God, we should love him, we should live for him, and we should help others do the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the hope of the gospel and the good news that we're not stuck in our sin and that death does not have to be the end for us, that we can have life eternal because you are the resurrection and the life and you've made that promise that if we believe in you, we become children of God and that even though we'll die in our physical bodies, we can live forever spiritually with you and that's an amazing hope, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes and our hearts on you. Help us to make it our passion and purpose just as it was yours to reveal your glory, your goodness, your power, your identity, your love to the people you've placed in our lives that more and more would come to know the saving grace of Jesus and live for you now and for eternity. That's our hope and our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Praise the King, He is risen. Praise the King, He's alive. Praise the King, death's defeated. Hallelujah, He's alive. Hallelujah, He's alive. 
is a reason why our hearts can be courageous. There's a reason why the dead are made alive. There's a reason why we share his resurrection. Jesus is alive. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. Death's defeated. King, he's alive. Praise the King, death's defeated. Hallelujah, he's alive. Oh, hallelujah, he's alive. Oh, hallelujah, he's alive. Worship team, thanks for being flexible there at the end as well. It's an amazing truth uh, that I think sometimes we take for granted and we just celebrate at Easter time and stuff like that. But the reality is, Jesus is the resurrection and life, He is our life. Let's live in him and with him and help others to do that this week as well. As you leave, uh, just a few reminders. Uh, that proposal is on the counter out there if you want a copy of that. Just stated simply so you can do that. Uh, elders will be in the conference room if you want to talk about that land purchase at all at all, please come and do that. If you have other questions or concerns, we want to talk with you, but we would like to reserve this time right now for questions about that. Uh, and then there's a couple other opportunities in the lobby. One, there's a small uh, Bible study for women, uh, both morning and evening happening this summer. You can sign up for that. The Grief Share Loss of a Spouse event uh, is going on. And I know uh, the, the golf tournament uh, is happening soon. If Jeff or... Uh, I don't see either of them here right now. Uh, this, there's a Stan Strength golf team coming up in, in August, a tourney coming up in August, and then there's also a men's camping trip coming out. There should be information about those things. So go check those out. Uh, spend some time in fellowship, and you guys have a great week. Thank you.